This morning, someone on my YouTube channel helpfully commented in response to my critique of Alyssa Childers that she had done a podcast a couple of years ago with an individual named Ann Kennedy, where they were both talking about the recent death of Rachel Held Evans and opining on how Evans wasn't a Christian and so on. So I decided I would listen to it. So thank you, Diane, for uh, letting me know about the podcast. I should have checked my blood pressure before listening to the podcast, but I've checked it now prior to uh, making this video, and it's at 120 over 70, so I should be okay for the next little while, although I do expect my blood pressure to rise. What I'm going to be doing is playing little clips from the podcast. I won't screen share uh, on YouTube because there's no video to go with it. So you'll just get my handsome face. Uh, but if you want to listen to the whole podcast, it is Rachel Held Evans and the Evangelical Crisis with Ann Kennedy on the Alyssa Childers podcast number 50. So I'm going to begin by listening to, uh, we'll listen to a series of clips where, um, Alyssa Childers and Ann Kennedy talk about the fact that Rachel Held Evans wasn't a Christian at all. So we're going to begin by listening to a clip. This is uh, four minutes and 47 seconds into the podcast. Uh, and Alyssa Childers is setting the stage. She's recalling how after Rachel Held Evans died, there was this outpouring of grief. And she's fine with expressing grief for the death of a person. But immediately, Childers notes that what concerned her was that some of the people who acknowledged grief over Rachel Held Evans's death also seemed to be thinking that she was a Christian. And this is very concerning to Alyssa Childers. Who, beyond just expressing grief or sympathy or prayers, we're calling her uh, like things like a voice of truth or a brave sister in Christ or someone who helped people to hold on to their faith through their doubts. And the reason I was distressed about this is because I've read her books and I have followed her and the gospel she was preaching was a different gospel and the faith that she was helping people hang on to was a different faith. So the first thing that uh, Alyssa Childers wants us to be clear on is that Rachel Held Evans wasn't a sister in Christ. She preached a completely different gospel, and she had a different religion, not a Christ, not Christianity. Okay, next we're going to listen to a clip where Childers is talking with her guest, Ann Kennedy, and talking about how Ann Kennedy posted this blog article on the Sunday morning within like 12 hours of the death of uh, Rachel Held Evans, in which Ann Kennedy expressed the hope that Rachel Held Evans could, in fact, be saved. We're going to listen to, it's about a minute and a half, this clip. We're going to listen to the whole thing and then talk a little bit about it. Expressed some grief over her death. And, and, and I think at the end you said, you know, I pray that in her last moments that she turned to Christ. You know, I, I pray that, that she did. And so this, I, I, from what I understand, you got quite a bit of backlash on, on that. And you had a lot of comments. So tell us, what was the response to that first article, and then we'll, we'll talk about the second one. I mean, who could imagine that there would be any backlash uh, with this person posting an article within 12 hours or so of the death of Rachel Held Evans saying, gee, I hope she finally became a Christian before she died so that she doesn't go to hell forever. I mean, who could be offended at that? I can't imagine. Well, I like to... I like to wake up at four o'clock in the morning on Sunday mornings and blog just as my way into the day because I, I love Sunday so much. Mm -hmm. And I uh, usually try to deal with our church's lectionary. And but then, I, you know, I had, she had died on Saturday. So I was just really that was at the top of my mind. And I was trying to deal with the scripture. And so I I just wrote about her in the way that I have written about a lot of things. And I did not know that I had been brave at all. <laughs> Some uh, just a spoiler alert, you weren't brave, but I'll get back to that. Somebody wrote me and said, wow, you're, you're so brave. And so then I got online I, and saw that I had been brave. I, <laughs> I was the wrong person on the internet and, um, it turned out that I, just that one line at the end that I prayed that she really had come to know the real Jesus, um, d really grieved and upset um, 
the people who have de- had depended on her um, for really their spiritual, as a spiritual guide. At least you were brave, right? So that's the upside. It's not brave, okay, to to post an article within 12 hours of a beloved Christian teacher's death saying, well, you hope they actually did become saved before they died so that they don't go to hell. Frankly, that sounds not only pastorally insensitive, a very low emotional intelligence uh, to post something like that, but it's, it's just obnoxious and it's ignorant. All right, so let's listen to another clip. Next, Ann Kennedy reflects on the fact that people were saying to her, essentially, why don't you recognize that Rachel Held Evans also was a Christian? She also followed Jesus, even though she didn't have all of your theological particularities. But she also was a Christian, and she also has a seat at the table as a Christian. Ann Kennedy wants to be very clear, no, she does not. What I had said, Ann was upset that... um you know, we're all at the same table, she wrote, and we may be sitting on different ends, but, you know, I should know that I'm at the same table and I should make room for, um, for people on, on that spec, on that end of the spectrum. Yeah. So I felt like I should get back on and say, you know, why it is that we're not at the same table and what, what our deep, um, disagreements are and how they aren't just disagreements am- among friends who all basically believe the same thing. Now, much of the podcast is going to then go into some depth on why they can't be friends. And we're going to come back to that and why Rachel Held Evans is not at the same table as Alyssa Childers and Ann Kennedy. We'll come back to that. But I want to follow through this theme by listening to just a couple more clips where they talk about how Rachel Held Evans wasn't a Christian and thus by implication, she went to hell. Uh, We'll just listen to a couple more clips before we turn to looking at what they think the differences are. This next clip for me is frankly the most offensive and obnoxious exchange in the whole podcast. This occurs at 39 minutes, 48 seconds in and go from there. Uh, Ann Kennedy here is talking about how the death of a, of a Christian, God's glory shines through it. But when a person dies who is not a Christian, it's clear that God's glory is not coming through in the same way. And that's the case with the death of Rachel Held Evans. Just listen to this clip. God emerges out of that. Um, you know, you can see God's glory in uh, a true Christian's death, yeah. um, and it's grievous, but it's um, it's strangely upbuilding for the church. Yeah. Um, and that just you can see in the spiraling out that the sort of the opposite of that has happened. Yeah. So if you listen there to what she says, she says God's glory again comes through in the death of a real Christian. But if the person who dies is not a real Christian, then you don't get God's glory. You get a, quote, spiraling out, which is what she attributes to the emotional impact and fallout of the death of Rachel Held Evans. First of all, of course, there's no serious criteria being offered here of analysis. This is just Ann Kennedy's subjective impressions based upon the fact that she doesn't think Rachel Held Evans was a Christian. But the whole thing is so disgusting just to to sit there and opine on the salvation and the Christian identity or non-Christian identity, allegedly, of of Rachel Held Evans, and to to do this in the face of all the people who were mourning her death, as if you are the self-appointed pope to decide who is and who is not a Christian. This is just conservative evangelicalism at its very worst. Now, the irony of, of so much of this is that when people like Alyssa Childers and Ann Kennedy get blowback from this, then in their eyes, the blowback, the opposition, the offense that they have invited is in their minds interpreted as evidence that they are being persecuted as true believers. Here, I'll just play a little clip of that from uh, Alyssa Childers. Okay, so this clip is at 11 minutes and 20 seconds into the podcast. 
Uh, Anne Kennedy is just recalling how a lot of people responded to her in a very mean way, and she had to delete their comments because they were offended that she said, well, I really hope that she managed to find salvation before she died. And she's like, feels like now she's the target, unfairly being persecuted by progressive Christians. And then Alyssa Childers pipes in and says, yeah, me too. I know what it's like to get attacked by progressive Christians. So here's the clip. I am no stranger to the progressive backlash. I had two or three articles that made their way around and received a lot of feedback that was per, a lot of personal attacks and, and things like that. So I definitely relate with what you were going through in the. Okay, so here Childers talks about, oh, I've had all these personal attacks myself. Childers in her book, as I recorded in my last video, among the things she does, she says that, again, progressive Christians are not Christians at all. Uh, they have another gospel. By implication, they're going to hell. And she imputes their motives, says that they are liars, that they're deceivers. She characterizes them as... Uh, in one, I believe it's page 99 in her book. Again, I talk about this in my other video. She talks about progressive pastors as wolves disguised as sheep who just want to eat some juicy sheep steak. So she has the most offensive uh, slurs and attacks on progressive Christians. And then when they respond to her, she's now the one getting attacked. I mean, this is gaslighting of the first order this is like the person who says, why does your face keep getting in the way of my fist, right? I'm I'm the one who's getting attacked suddenly <clears throat> when I'm the one who's been attacking you the whole time. Like I said, this is gaslighting. And elsewhere in this podcast, uh, and I may play the clip later, Ann Kennedy talks about how she believes that Rachel Held Evans actually was a deceiver. Okay, uh, I've primed up that clip. So this is... Uh, right after Ann Kennedy has been talking about how Rachel Held Evans wrote the book, The Year of Biblical Womanhood, and how she believes that, in fact, Rachel Held Evans was mocking the Bible. So she interprets her as, uh, in, in 2740, she says she's, quote, mocking the text. Why is she mocking the text? Well, because she's engaging in a critique of the text through this this humorous motif of trying to apply all of these biblical texts literally what she's actually doing is seriously illustrating the issues of patriarchy and critiquing some standard evangelical conservative ways of reading the bible she's not mocking the text what she's critiquing is this kind of ham-fisted unthinking way of engaging the text that's so common among some conservative evangelicals like frankly Alyssa Childers uh, but she accuses her of mocking. And at, at the, here's what she says uh, at 27 minutes in to the podcast. This is what Ann Kennedy says. She, she's a, Here she's addressing the issue. Well, why didn't uh, uh, Rachel Held Evans engage with the text in a more nuanced way that I would agree with uh, and, and apply better hermeneutics according to what I think hermeneutics should be? Here's what she says. He didn't. She did. She either didn't have any of those tools at her fingertips or she deliberately put them aside and refused to use them. Um, and I, I would imagine it's a little bit of both that she decided not to because she wanted, you know, she had she had an agenda to some degree. Yeah. OK, so there she is accusing her. She's saying, so this is after she's already said why, well, I hope she can be saved before she was saved before she died. Here she goes on to impugn her character by saying that she deliberately suppressed legitimate, valuable, correct readings of the Bible because she had an agenda. What was the agenda? Well, she explains later, as I said, is to mock the Bible. So what people like Childers and Ann Kennedy do time and again is when they disagree with people like uh, Rachel Held Evans or Peter Enns, who they also referred to in this podcast, it's not enough to disagree with them. They also have to impugn their character. They have to attribute to them immoral, corrupt motives. I talk about this in my book, You're Not As Crazy As I Think, Dialogue in a World of Loud Voices and Hardened Opinions, where I point out that people from an indoctrinated mindset typically go to one of two basic ways of marginalizing dissenting opinions. Either you say that that person is just flatly ignorant and that's why they don't agree with me, 
or you say they are immoral, they're evil, and that's why they don't agree with me. Or maybe you combine the two and say they're immoral and uh, ignorant. So uh, in this case, what Ann Kennedy is doing is saying, well, why didn't uh, Rachel Held Evans approach the text the way I would? Well, it must be either both because she was ignorant of this proper way that I think exists to read the text, and also because she was malevolent or evil or wicked, that she wanted to subvert the text and later on to, quote, mock the text. And that's some examples of why she thinks and and uh, Alyssa Childers think that Rachel Held Evans was not a Christian at all. She had these evil motives. So they benevolently hope that maybe she was saved right before she died because she clearly wasn't saved before that moment. Now, there's a lot more I could say about this podcast, but I just, rather than play any more clips, I'm just going to talk briefly about a few things. So first of all, let's just go back to the fundamental thesis that Ann Kennedy and uh, Alyssa Childers both assume, which is that Rachel Held Evans was not a Christian at all. She had another gospel, another religion, another Jesus. What justifies that? Did Rachel Held Evans reject the doctrine of the Trinity? No, they don't even talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. Did she reject the doctrine of incarnation? No, they don't talk about the doctrine of incarnation. Did she reject the doctrine of atonement? I can tell you, no, she did not ever reject the doctrine of atonement. But in their podcast, in this podcast interview, they say at one point that uh, people like Rachel Held Evans have a sort of um, progressive therapeutic deism, which implies that they've rejected the atonement, but she hasn't. That's clearly false. And they have they provide no evidence that she rejected the atonement. Uh, so what is the ground of disagreement? She doesn't reject the incarnation, the Trinity, the atonement. What is it? What it is, ultimately, is that she rejected their fundamentalist way of reading the Bible. Now, this, of course, is something on which I've written a book, Jesus Loves Canaanites. I've done dozens of videos and articles on it. I'm not going to get into it here, except to say that... Um, one thing, so Childers is so grossly ignorant here. Uh, she critiques Rachel Held Evans and 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 Kennedy. They critique her for appealing to things like intuition, moral intuition, logic, and reason as she reads and interprets the text of Scripture. Uh, but what she is doing is no different than what is exactly called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, where that is what you do. You draw upon reason, you draw upon tradition, you draw upon experience. And those all are part of the hermeneutical spiral of returning to the text and rereading the text. But it seems that Alyssa Childers uh, and Ann Kennedy, by implication as well, are just so ignorant of theological method that they're not even aware of what Rachel Held Evans is doing. So instead, what they kind of suggest is a very naive biblicism that all you do is read the Bible for yourself and you don't have any external inputs to form how you read the text or form scripture coming out of the nexus of these other sources in interaction with scripture. At one point, when they're talking about the year of biblical womanhood, they critique Rachel Held Evans because she sat on the roof of her house because for, for to, to represent when she was being a quarrelsome wife. Uh, now they point out that, well, in fact, uh, the text in Proverbs says better for the husband to sit on the corner of the roof than to share a roof with a quarrelsome wife. But the main point that they make in critically responding to the fact that Rachel Held Evans did that in her book is that, well, that's not what the text of Proverbs means. It's not saying that literally a man should sit on the corner of his roof. And so they suggest that Rachel Held Evans is just engaging in bad hermeneutics by in her year of biblical womanhood sitting on the corner of her roof because they just she's misunderstanding what the text of Proverbs is about. On the contrary, I think the irony here is that it's Ann Kennedy and Alyssa Childers who have the ham-fisted hermeneutics. And they don't understand, apparently even in a most basic way, what Rachel Held Evans is doing. Her point is not that the Proverbs should be interpreted literally and applied literally, her point is to give a humorous and memorable illustration of constant patriarchal themes in scripture, including in the Proverbs. The Proverbs are consistently written in a patriarchal perspective. They never talk about a nagging husband or an abusive husband. What they're talking about is the nagging wife. And so she's critiquing that through a visual illustration, a performative illustration. But apparently that flies over their heads 
and they impugn to her this absurd reading uh, that the, the, the Proverbs are supposed to be interpreted literally, which was never her intent. And I just want to point out a couple more things that I think are just indicative of the broad sweeping ignorance of Rachel Held Evans. Uh, she and, and her guest, Ann Kennedy, they talk derisively about liberation theology. First thing is, is that um, <clears throat> Alyssa Childress says, well, liberation theology started in the 50s or the 60s. Now, that's interesting. That's sort of indicative of the fact of somebody who sort of knows the term but doesn't really understand it in any deep or meaningful sense. Liberation theology began in 1968 uh, when Gustavo Gutierrez published The Theology of Liberation. Uh, not long after that, it went from the favelas and the barrios of Latin America, where they were understanding what does salvation mean in our context of extreme poverty in Latin America. And it spread into North America and into Black liberation theology with people like James Cone. And I'll tell you, uh, they speak derisively about liberation theology, but one of the most powerful theological addresses I ever heard came from James Cone. Uh, he was a, wonder, was a wonderful, challenging theologian. Uh, and challenge systemic racial oppression and certain ways of understanding the gospel, which are, are, I think, deeply rooted in systemic oppression. And that is one of the many gifts of liberation theology. But Alyssa Childers and Kennedy, they don't have any patience or ability to adopt nuanced categories. Instead, they just say liberation theology was bad, but now it's dead and sadly, some progressives are trying to start it up again. Instead of recognizing that liberation theology, while never a perfect movement, as certainly evangelical Christianity is not a perfect movement either. Amen? Do I have an amen? Nonetheless, there's no sense that you can find the good in liberation theology and learn from it. It's the same thing when they talk about the, quote, historical critical method. Now, at this point, uh, Childress talks very in, in a very broad way about the historical critical method rising in, I think she said the 17th century and continuing to today, but it's quote, this is what she says, it's quote, not useful. So nothing, she doesn't say there's anything we can learn from historical biblical criticism or textual criticism, form criticism, redaction criticism, none of these things she thinks there's any use in them. She just says they're quote, not useful. I mean, I think that that is just grossly unnuanced and ignorant. There's all sorts of things that we've learned from biblical studies and the textual critical study of the texts and how they were formed over time. Now, and what an extraordinary thing at 35 minutes and 50 seconds in, she says that historical critics don't believe the Bible is inspired. This is another point where like my blood pressure, I need to check my blood pressure again. I mean, the, the sheer fact that there is no nuance at all in this statement, that historical critics don't believe the Bible is inspired, it's just maddening. But it's indicative of how ignorant Alyssa Childers is, that she makes these kinds of sweeping, anti-intellectual, indefensible claims. I could go on, but I want to draw this to a conclusion just by, again, highlighting the, the moral offense, not just the ignorance of people like Ann Kennedy and Alyssa Childers, but the moral offense that like the like worst kind of Pharisee, they, they sit here together and talk about how they hope that Rachel Held Evans was maybe saved, but she probably wasn't. She certainly wasn't a Christian or saved during her life. And yet their whole statements are based on ignorance and caricatures, straw men, and a sense of self-superiority that is just noxious and just toxic. You know, this is why, this is why so many Christians, millennials, Gen Z, find themselves alienated from the church. Because when they have questions and doubts and they're seeking theological nuance, they instead get batted down and their questions and doubts get free, reframed as subversive, immoral challenges to the gospel once for all delivered unto the saints. When in fact, what they are simply doing is moving from milk to solid food. That's what it is to grow theologically, spiritually, and intellectually. And Rachel Held Evans modeled that beautifully in her life, both with a devout character of de desiring to follow Christ and in theologically and culturally challenging books. By contrast, I think that what 
Alyssa Childers offers is a theological and moral desert.